Today we're going to look at one verse of Scripture, one statement of Jesus that's one of the most powerful declarations that he ever uttered on the theme of discipleship. It's in Luke chapter 9 and verse 23. But before we do that, I'd like to take a look at what a disciple is. And then consider Jesus' threefold requirement for discipleship. There, there's a blue-green insert in your bulletin today. You can kind of take that out, help you follow along, give you an opportunity to take some notes, at, you know, some things that might jump out at you. But to begin with, a disciple is a learner, a student. He, he learns certain principles from his teacher, and then he orders his life accordingly. In Jesus' day, there were many disciples. In fact, the word was just as common as our word student is today. Uh, Every good teacher had several disciples. In the Bible, we read about the disciples of John the Baptist. We read about the disciples of the Pharisees. So if we're going to be disciples of Christ, we've got to be students of Christ, learning from Him, listening to His Word. I dare say that many who claim to be followers of Jesus today are a far cry from students. There are a lot of church members who are woefully ignorant of the Word of Christ. You know, some Christians think that the the Tower of Babel it's where Solomon kept all of his wives. I remember being in a class one time and, and mentioned that, that David extended the, the kingdom of Israel from Dan to Beersheba. And somebody says, you mean those are places? I thought those were brother and sister like Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, but we don't, we don't make any apologies here at Valley View for the fact that we teach the Word of God. God wants us to be students of Christ. He wants us to learn His Word. He wants us to know Him. A first, but a, but a, you, we've got to go beyond just educating the mind. You see, God wants to transform our hearts. He wants to change our character. And so the first century disciple and disciples today go a step further than a modern student goes. Because those disciples were not only learners and students, they were also imitators of their teacher. The disciples strove to imitate not only the precepts that he'd been taught, but every facet of his master's life. The goal of the disciple was to, as much as possible, duplicate the life of his instructor. In fact, in Luke 640, and it's on the front of your bulletin today, a disciple is not above his teacher. But everyone who is fully trained will be like his teacher. That's the theme of this whole series. Christ calls us to imitate Him, to become like Him. And He's not talking about a cheap imitation. You know, today the word word imitation is often used negatively in in our consumer culture. Shoppers for purses or watches, other things are warned to watch out for knockoffs, for cheap imitations. But the imitation that Jesus encouraged was not a cheap imitation. If we really want to be His disciple... If we're serious about being a disciple of Jesus, Christ-likeness is our goal. Every day, in every single way, you and I should be striving to think and act and speak as Jesus would. To imitate Him. So a disciple is a student, an imitator. And now let's take a look at those who were called disciples in the Scripture. Because there are those today who would have us believe that there's a difference between being a disciple and being a Christian. In other words, they teach that a person can be saved and yet not be a disciple of Jesus. But the Bible never makes that kind of distinction. In fact, in Acts 11, Luke informs us the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. See, it was was the disciples who were first called Christians. The Bible uses the words Christian and disciple synonymously, interchangeably. Over 20 times in the book of Acts alone, The term disciple is used to mean every believer that it's a part of the church of Christ. Every church member, every Christian is a disciple of Jesus. No one can be saved and then later become a disciple. In fact, Jesus made that very clear when he gave the Great Commission. And he says, I want you to go and make disciples and baptize them. To be a genuine follower of Christ. To enjoy an abundant and happy life here in order to be sure of a home in heaven hereafter, there are three requirements Jesus mentions about being a disciple. And they're right here in this verse. Luke 9, verse 23. Let's read it together. He says, He was saying to them all, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Three things. First of all, we must deny ourselves. Now, the Greek word translated deny there 
meant to refuse association and companionship with someone, to disown them. And the one Jesus says to be disowned is self. And that means all together. We are to disown ourself. Not merely some portion of ourself, some habit, some practice, some lust, some outward practice. So many people see self-denial as merely cutting out beer and peanuts at the Broncos game this afternoon. Or giving up ice cream. But self-denial is the denial of self. It's the denial of our natural instinct to pr- protect and preserve ourself. It is, as we sang a while ago, the crucifixion of self. It's not merely an occasional or one-time thing. The denial of self is more than just giving up certain things at certain times like Lent. It is giving up someone, yourself. So that you no longer live for self, but for Christ. You no longer are out to do your own will, you're out to do His will. We become so obsessed with Him that we are consumed with Jesus. And are no longer focused on ourselves. On our own desires, on our own pleasures. You think about this. Today, people are absolutely obsessed with reality TV shows. 20 years ago, reality TV shows didn't even exist. Today, people are absolutely obsessed with food. Now, I'm not talking about people that really love Twinkies or Doritos. I'm talking about foodies who spend crazy amounts in restaurants and watch cooking shows nonstop. Today, people are obsessed with sports. I know people have always had a great interest in sports, but not like there is today. You know, those fantasy teams, football, baseball, things like that, didn't even exist 20 years ago. 20 years ago, it was safe to go to a game. Today, people are so crazy about their teams, there are murders every year at football games. Today, people are obsessed with Halloween. Do you know Americans spend $7 billion a year on Halloween? When I was a kid, it was just some candy and a homemade outfit. Maybe you'd get one of your mom's sheets, cut a hole in it, and stick your head through it, and you were a ghost. What's going on in our culture with all this obsession? Here's my theory. God made us. He created us to be obsessed with Him. To love Him with all our heart and soul and mind and strength. And we can't turn off the fact that we were created to be obsessed. And so as people drift further and further away from God, as our culture moves away from Him, they turn their obsession to other things. And unfortunately, they're always lesser things that will never really satisfy them. So what are you obsessed with? I don't know how you could have gone through that time of worship and singing this morning and not realize how obsessed we should be with Jesus. Maybe it's time to be obsessed with God as He intended us to be. We must deny ourselves pleasures that are harmful and degrading. We must say no, God says, to our natural desires and natural impulses because you and I are not only human. And we must learn to abhor the sin that harms and destroys us. See, we, we may often think it's easier to do, deny ourselves gradually. That's why he says, I want you to deny yourself. Jesus calls for a radical amputation of all possible sources of temptation in our lives. On two different occasions, near the beginning of his ministry in Matthew 5 and later in his ministry, Jesus said, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away. It's better to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. I remember reading years ago about a boy, he was eight or nine years old, and they had a new cocker spaniel in their family, and he overheard his mom and dad talking about getting the tail's pup, uh, I mean the pup's tail docked. That was common practice for spaniels back then, and he later asked his dad, you know, what's that mean, to get his tail docked? And he said, well, it means you cut off a large part of the dog's tail because spaniels spaniels tend to hunt in the woods and their tails are really bushy and they get caught in the heavy underbrush and the brambles and they would tear and bleed and get infected and cause them a lot of pain and so docking the end of that tail would eliminate a lot of the risk of injury the boy said well does it hurt him and his dad said well it probably hurts for a little while but it saves him a lot of days of of pain and and even the chance of death from infection a few days later Dad had forgot all about it. He was reading his paper in the news, uh, or his newspaper out in the living room, and he heard the dog just crying, yelping, bloody murder, you know. 
And, and the dad ran out into the garage where the sound was coming from, and there he found his son with the dog's tail on a two-by-four and a hatchet in his hand. And his dad said, what in the world are you doing? He says, I, I knew we were going to have to cut his tail off, and I thought it would hurt less if I just did it a little bit at a time. And that's a true story. All you PETA people, uh, you know, I'll give you the address later. No, that was, that was years ago, okay? Sometimes we get the idea, though, that it's easier to deny ourselves gradually. So we allow ourselves little indulgences. We play with sin and with temptation. Oh, we're, we're okay with some sins remaining in our lives. We don't want to get too radical. And we develop an easygoing tolerance of sin. We don't abhor sin the way God does. You know what Proverbs says? If you respect the Lord, you will hate evil. God commands us to hate sin. Paul says that we're not only to hate sin. He says we should hate even the garment that is polluted by the flesh. And when we develop that kind of abhorrence of sin, the very same kind that God has, then we will deny ourselves. Not just deny things, we will deny our own desires. Remember uh, the, the, the desires that are harmful. The desires that are destructive. Remember how Peter, after Christ had been arrested, was asked if he had been with Jesus? And three times Peter said, and in some translations... Uh, very literally, I know not the man. That's the same Greek word that's used here by Luke for denying ourselves. We must say of ourselves, I know not the man. I don't know that person within me whose desires are not Christ's. I don't know that person within me who suggests destructive actions and harmful attitudes. I don't know that person within me whose interest is only to please self, to promote self, to parade self, to, to pamper self. God says, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. He emptied himself. Jesus denied himself to serve others. And to please God. We too have got to learn as disciples of Christ to deny ourselves. To deny that within us that is going to destroy us. For the good of others and for the good of ourselves. Secondly, we, we are to take up, we're not only to deny ourselves, we are to take up our cross daily. And that word daily means continually, persistently. See, there's no time off for a disciple of Christ. I'm going to be in uh, tomorrow... Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, I'm going to be in Las Vegas. All kinds of things go on in Las Vegas. But I belong to Him. And I'm going to live there the same way that I live here. It doesn't matter who's around. There's a book out called, Who Are You When Nobody's Looking? It's a book on integrity. Christian integrity. See, we're always on duty. Taking up the cross has a twofold meaning. First of all, the cross is a symbol for death. Crucifixion was the primary mode of punishment in the, in the Roman world. Uh, nearly every century, I mean, a cemetery in the country today has at least one cross marking somebody's grave. So when Jesus says, take up your cross, it's a further emphasis on the daily death to self. The crucifixion of my fleshly desires. Galatians 5 says, we are to crucify the flesh. That is, put it to death with its passions and its desires. We're to slay self-interest. We are to veto ego. Romans 6 is probably the clearest on this. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus, been brought into Christ, have been baptized into His death, therefore we have been buried with Him through baptism into death, in order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might also walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with Him in the likeness of His death, if we have died to sin and to self, then we shall also be united with Him in the likeness of His resurrection, raised to new life. Because we know that our old self 
That old nature was crucified with Him, put to death with Him, that our body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. So consider yourselves, he says, to be dead, to dead to sin, and alive to God in Christ Jesus. You and I, as disciples of Christ, are in Christ. We are obsessed with Christ. We are wholly in love with Jesus. We are dead to sin, and we are set free from sin's power and sin's pull. But Jesus' statement has another meaning. Because the cross is also a symbol, not only of death, but of sacrifice. Jesus was the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. Paul called Him our Passover Lamb, sacrificed for us. Jesus chose to bear His cross for us. It was not forced upon Him. Just yesterday, in my quiet time, I was in John the 10th chapter, where Jesus says, I am willing to give up my life in order that I may receive it back again. No one takes my life from me. I give it up of my own free will. I have the right to give it up, and I have the right to take it back again. Occasionally, I'll hear somebody talking about some of the problems, difficulties, the struggles that they're going through in life as their cross to bear. Maybe it's some illness. You know, maybe it's having problems financially, or maybe they've had a car wreck, or having trouble with their teenagers, or difficulties with with a manager at work, or something like that. Let me just remind you or or inform you, those are not crosses to bear. Those are the common problems all of us have living in a fallen world. We're all going to have those problems. Jesus said, in this world, you'll have tribulation. The cross that Jesus is talking about always has to do with the fact that we are doing God's will. It is something we choose It is a willingness to sacrifice for the sake of our faith, for the sake of our love for Jesus. Occasionally, it may involve suffering. But only if it's suffering because we are living to please God and not ourselves. More often than not, it's simply another form of dying to our own self. Sacrificing the things that we may naturally desire. Things that aren't good for us, but we may naturally desire those things. And... and It might even be sacrificing some of the things that we love for something or someone that we love even more. See, the cross is basically the same in every case. It's the cross of self. In Mark uh, 10.21, we have an example of one man's cross. A cross that he refused to bear. This man had come to Jesus and asked what he had to do to receive eternal life. He was a good man. Great man, you'd like this guy for your neighbor. Very moral man. He told Jesus that he had kept all the commandments from the time he was a child. And it says Jesus looked upon him and he loved him. But he also saw in his heart. And he saw one thing that was keeping him from real life, from really being a disciple. And Jesus said, one thing you lack. This is him, not referring to all of us. I believe all of us have things we lack that we have to sacrifice. But one thing you lack, he said to this man... Go and sell all you possess and give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Be my disciple. This young man's cross was his self-centered love for money and wealth. And we're told that he went away sorrowful. To him, that cross seemed too hard to bear. Yet in not taking it up, there was much sorrow and sadness. If we want real joy and peace, we've got to take up whatever cross God has permitted to traverse our life's path. But often that cross seems too hard to bear, too much to sacrifice. The cross is simply a measure of our love for Jesus. Just as Jesus' cross was a measure of His love for God and His love for us. And as He faced that cross, He was fully aware of the pain and the suffering, the agony, the sacrifice that He would be making. And He prayed, Father, if it be possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Nevertheless, He said, let your will be done rather than mine. He preferred to avoid the cross. I mean, if there was any other possible way that he could do God's will and save us from our sin, he wanted to do that. He didn't want that pain. He didn't want that agony. That was self in him crying out to avoid pain. But there was no other way. And he was willing to give up what he loved, a life without pain, for something he loved even more, us. Doing God's will. Pleasing His Father. And so He humbled Himself. He took up His cross. And He gave His life that you and I might be here today. And might sing these songs of freedom. 
that we've experienced in him. And he asks us to do the same thing. Anytime we give up something we love doing, something we love, whether it's doing our own thing or a life of comfort and convenience or spending our money on ourselves or giving up our time, sacrificing our desires, our own pleasures, whenever we give up something that we love for something that we love even more, our relationship with God, building God's kingdom, doing God's will, fulfilling His purpose, that's taking up our cross. And sometimes it hurts. But like Jesus, we do it willingly, voluntarily, gladly, all because of love. That's the only motivation. You often gladly sacrifice for your children, for your grandchildren, because of your love for them. And when we do that, because of our love for God, we're taking up our cross. Yes, there may be pain involved, but only briefly because the pain dissolves in joy. For the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. It dissolves in joy and peace in satisfaction that we are where God wants us to be, right in the middle of his will, expressing our love for him. I saw a store one time, had all kinds of jewelry in the window. And on that, in that display, there were several crosses and sign above them said, easy terms. And I thought, you know, that's exactly what the world's looking for. Cheap crosses with easy terms. But the cross Jesus calls us to bear isn't cheap and it's not easy. His wasn't. But let me tell you this, it is worth it all. 41 years, 42 years as a Christian, it is worth it all. He calls us to do His will, to please Him, to love Him more than anything else in this life. And so we take up our cross daily, dying to sin, to self, to to joyfully give up those things that we love, a lot of them that aren't even good for us, for the things that we love even more, pleasing and honoring Him. The third essential of discipleship is Jesus' command, follow me. The Greek is a persistent action verb. Really, it should be translated, keep on following me. We don't follow him sporadically. We don't follow him at, you know, various intervals of our life. He calls us to follow him continually and and unceasingly. I think we need to take a lesson from the apostles. In Matthew uh, chapter 4, Jesus found Peter and Andrew, and they were fishing. And he looked at them and he said, come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Let me be your God. Follow me. And in the very next verse, Matthew says, they dropped what they were doing, left their nets at once, and followed him. Mark says they immediately followed him. Can we do any less? When we consider who it is that's calling us to follow him, when we consider to what He is calling us, that life of abundance, that life of joy, that life of meaning and peace and satisfaction, it only makes sense to drop all that we formerly considered important and immediately follow Him. Jim Elliot said, He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he can never lose. God says, You have been called for this purpose. Since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. We've been called to retrace Jesus' footsteps, to share in his sufferings, to walk where he walked. In fact, the Bible says, the one who says he abides in Christ ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. Too often we think, well, we can't do that. Absolutely we cannot. But Christ is the one who lives within us. The Holy Spirit's job is to transform us into His image day by day. 2 Corinthians 3.18, it's a good verse to memorize. He is there and He is transforming us. We can't do it on our own. In the same manner means that that imitation must be exact. And in all things, His life is the perfect pattern for our own. So we should live in humility and righteousness, doing what He would do, acting as He would act, talking like He would talk, loving others even as He loves us. 
Think about it. If Jesus was in your place tomorrow, what would he do? If he sat at your desk, he worked at your job, would he, he do anything different than you do? If he were the head of your family, if he were the parent of your children or the grandchildren, would he change anything? As disciples of Christ, that ought to be the measuring stick of our lives. What would Jesus do if he were in each of the situations I find myself in every day? You know, if he ran my business or worked at my job or spent my money or lived with my spouse and my kids and worked with my fellow workers, to live as he showed us, to walk like him, to imitate our Lord, is the, really the summary of a true disciple's life. And I'd like to challenge you, before you ever do anything, prior to making any decision, ask yourself, what would Jesus do? And then follow him. Now, to really understand how he would react under any given circumstance, we would need to really know a lot about his nature and his character. His culture was so different from ours. We're involved in situations that Jesus was never in. He never watched a playoff football game. Seriously. There are probably more situations that we're involved in that Jesus was never involved in than there are similar situations. And that means we would need to study the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, very deeply to see his innermost character and discern his course of action. That's why personal Bible study, especially of the Gospels, is so very important. I mean, how can we even hope to be like Jesus if we have no idea what Jesus said or did or thought? Without saturating our mind with his story, with his words, we can't accurately answer that question, what would Jesus do in this situation? But Jesus wants to give us his mind. And he has opened his mind to us in his word. Be honest with yourself. Are you following him? Are you walking in the same manner that he walked? Jesus has called us to deny ourselves, to take up our cross daily and to follow him. How are you doing as a wholehearted follower, a genuine disciple of Jesus? Are you closer to him now than you were at the beginning of 2013? Over this past year, our leaders have decided that this is the most important thing, in fact, the primary thing that God calls us as a church to do, to make disciples. Our business, our one purpose is to help people know and love Jesus with all their heart and to be fully devoted followers of Jesus until He takes us home to be with Him forever. And not only to teach, but also to model that kind of commitment. We believe that, that everything we do must lead to that end. And that God holds us accountable to help you become the disciple Jesus has called you to be. That always has been our focus, but I think sometimes we've not done a very good job explaining how some of the things we do help each of us become the disciples Jesus longs for us to be. So that's going to be a major focus for us this year, as I mentioned last week. And we want to be able to measure how we're doing and how you're progressing. I want to encourage you to fill out the two-minute survey in the lobby, out in the lobby information tree. We had it in our bulletin last week. Or go on our website, the location's on the back of your bulletin, and and we want, we're going to ask you to fill this out at the beginning of each quarter, first, first week or two of each quarter, to help us measure our discipleship. You can print it out off our website. You can use it in your quiet time if you see areas where you need to, to work on. It won't even take you two minutes. I, I, probably more like 90 seconds. But we're going to be introducing many different opportunities in 2014 to help you develop as a wholehearted lover of Jesus. Here's the thing. We can provide the tools. Only you can provide the heart. And it's the heart that he wants to transform. A good place to start is by getting into, you know, one of our uh, foundational classes. We ha we ha we're having those, all four of them next week. And there's a tan insert in your bulletin to explain that. Uh, if you've gone through those, I would encourage you to get into heart transformation. Where you really uh, put yourself in a position for God to transform your heart. It's about a six-month-long uh, process that you go through, and then it's a lifelong process, but a six-month-long time you meet with other people. Or get into one of our step studies uh, that will help you. 
Third step is I consciously choose to commit all my life and will to Christ's care and control. And, and, and those step studies will help you, will transform you. Uh, we're going to develop some other studies. But look at the next steps on the back of your uh, c- connection card. I want to encourage every single person in this auditorium, whether you're a member of this church or not, whether you're visiting, get serious about being a genuine, wholehearted follower of Jesus. Fill out that discipleship survey. It's anonymous. You don't have to put your name on it. But fill it out each quarter. Fill it out now. It's, it'll help you. Look at where you are. Truly deny myself. Not just deny things to myself, but to become obsessed with Jesus as the love of my life and then realize that I died. My old life. That old nature is crucified with Jesus and I want to live out who I am. A new creature in Christ. A child of the King. And get involved in one of these things that are going to help you to grow, to build, to develop. And if you need some help tr- figuring out where you are, you know, do, the, do that uh, discipleship survey. Give me a call. Give Jeff uh, Langley a call. And we can help you. Any of the staff can help you with that. God bless you. Let's together make this a great year of growth in the Lord.